Oh, before while I wait, I should turn off my phone. <laughs> you could probably start. Well, no, they're trying to through the live stream. Oh. oh. Good afternoon. My name is Alice Yang, and it's my privilege to be chair of the history department. And I'd like to welcome all of you to the inaugural lecture of the Maya K. Peterson Explorations in History Seminar Series. And the series was established by many, many donors, and we're very thankful for everyone who donated to this worthy series to honor one of our most beloved faculty members in the history department that we lost all too soon. But before I introduce our speaker, um, I'd like to introduce Maya's mother, Professor Indira Peterson. She is a professor emerita of Asian studies at Mount Holyoke College. And she will be giving a lecture tomorrow um, from two to 3.30 in Humanities One. 520 that is entitled Violins and Venus, Airs and Ragas, Dialogues Between European and Indian Music in 19th Century India. Please welcome Professor Indira Peterson. I'm here as Maya's mother, not as Professor Peterson. Uh, although tomorrow, maybe I'll put on that hat, but even then, I'll just be someone who has some work that I would love to share with you no more. Thank you, Professor Alice Yang, for permitting me to say a few words on the occasion of this inaugural lecture for the Explorations in History seminar series, a lecture that has been made possible by the endowment that the History Department at UCSC has established in memory of my beloved daughter, Maya. I speak on behalf of myself and my husband, Mark Peterson, who passed away last year, but who is present in spirit. Also on behalf of all of Maya's family members, including her beloved partner, Mom Kilpatrick, right here. I thank all those whose generous donations have made this memorial endowment a reality. My late mother-in-law, Jean Peterson, who just passed away in March, made a major gift and that brought it to completion. Thanks to the History Department and the Humanities Office of Development here at UCSC for initiating and stewarding this endowment and its projects. I believe they include student research as well as the seminar series. I thank in particular Dean Jasmine Allender and Carrie Napolis, who's, who've been pleasure to work with, Senior Director of Development and both of them in the Humanities Division. We all know that Maya made friends wherever she went, that she was at home in the world, but she found a special home here in the community of students, faculty and friends at UCSC. Maya thrived and flourished here and she was passionately committed to public education. The seminar series that all of you, her colleagues have created is a fitting testament to her legacy and to the love that you bear for her, for which we are most grateful. Thank you for keeping her flame burning bright to benefit generations to come. Thanks also to Professor Asif Siddiqui for delivering a lecture on a subject that resonates so well with Maya's scholarship on the intersection of history and science. Further, I'm happy to report on the memorial endowments that have been set up by other institutions with which Maya was connected. South Hadley High School gives scholarships to two graduating seniors each year. The Association for Slavic, East European and Eurasian Studies awards a graduate research fellowship in her name. And Swarthmore College has created a Maya Peterson Student Research and Travel Award. Maya's spirit lives on. Lastly, I wanted to tell you about the memorial bench that Mark and I adopted, overlooking a small lake on the Mount Holyoke College campus in South Hadley, Massachusetts. 
where Maya grew up. A plaque on the bench describes her as follows, scholar, teacher, lover of nature, citizen of the world. Ducks and geese swim on the lake. The bench sits near a waterfall in Stony Brook, a stream flowing into the great Connecticut River. A small garden has sprung up almost spontaneously around it. Well, not spontaneously, with the care of Mount Holyoke gardeners. With flowering bushes, a young birch, a red bud, and evergreen trees. As the seasons change, the bench is covered with flowers, leaves, rain, and snow. I invite all of you to visit us in South Hadley, to sit quietly on Maya's bench and contemplate her beautiful spirit and the waters and the world of nature that she loved so much. Thank you. Thank you, Indira. And now it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Professor Asif Siddiqui. He is a professor of history at Fordham University, where he teaches and writes on the history of science and technology. Professor Siddiqui received his PhD from Carnegie Mellon University and then had a postdoc at Harvard. His many publications include Sputnik and Soviet Space Challenge and the Soviet Space Race with Apollo, the Red Rocket Sclare, Space Flight, and the Soviet Imagination from 1857 to 1957, as well as many journal articles. He also has many awards, which include a National Science Foundation Award, the American Historical Association's Fellowship in Aerospace History, and a Guggenheim Fellowship. Professor Siddiqui's talk today is based on research for his forthcoming book, Behind the Wire, Science, Technology, and the Making of Stalin's Gulag. The title of his talk today is The Gulag's First Monument, Stalin's Engineers, the White Sea Canal, and the Making of Modern Soviet Modernity. Please welcome Professor Asif Siddiqui. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you. Alice, for the kind introduction. I hope you guys can hear me. Um, uh, thank you to everybody here. Uh, Junaid also, uh, UC Santa Cruz, the History Department. Um, Anna, uh, I want to acknowledge the support of the Mike K. Peterson Memorial Endowment. Um, and uh, finally, I want to thank Maya Peterson's uh, immediate family, Indira, Marm, and uh, her other family members. So I confess I'm a bit humbled by this occasion to give this lecture, um, the inaugural lecture in the series named after Maya. I knew Maya, uh, but I, I can't claim that I knew her very well, although our paths crossed occasionally at conferences. Uh, she was unfailingly polite, patient, and generous um, as a scholar in a field that's um, uh, known for often, you know, its cutthroat competition. Um, I can say without any qualification that her research work, about which she spoke very modestly, um, has made a towering contribution to a number of different fields, including Soviet history, which I write about. Um, her research served as a call uh, for many of us to rethink our own work. Her intervention in suturing together the fields of Soviet Central Asia with the broader concerns of environmental history was as important as it was groundbreaking. But her work was also resonant, I think, because it showed a deep empathy uh, with its subjects. As academics were trained to be remote, we perform the delicate dance of dispassion and strip our language down to its bare essentials to convey the hard, brittle facts of the matter. Maya's work was not in that mold. She wrote and spoke about real lives, real worlds, real consequences, uh, but with a kind of empathy about our past that suggested that she was also thinking about our future that perhaps we might build or seek to build a better one. Um, we worked in very different areas of Soviet history. I'm a historian of science, uh, but the more I became familiar with her work, the more it seemed it spoke to me too, uh, particularly her centering of water in her stories, the way she treated water as a category of analysis, where she foregrounded um, all the different manifestations of, that water could bring to a given ecology, uh, water as life, as energy, as uh, 
power, as waste, as irrigation, and so on. These heuristics were particularly influential to me as I'm writing this current book, which, um, as Alice mentioned, is on on the Stalinist Gulag. And I'll hope I hope that her work will become evident as I read through my uh, paper today. So my talk today is on one level. It's about a canal. I don't know if you what you can see, but um, it's a rather famous canal. It's officially known as the White Sea Baltic Canal, and it was built in the 1930s at the height of Stalinism. Um, this is a picture of what it looks like today, an airborne picture or one part of it, actually. Um, it looks very serene and calm, but it hides a masks of very uh, violent history. Um, it, the, such large infrastructural projects were a consistent feature of the Stalinist era, often associated with the redirection of large bodies of water or the use of water to generate energy or both. They distilled a Stalinist obsession with the conquest of nature, large scale technological systems, and the display value of national achievements, what I call hydraulic monumentalism, the display value of water related infrastructure, uh, like dams and canals and these kinds of things. Um, uh, in the Soviet case, much of this infrastructure was built by forced labor that belonged to the Gulag camp network, which is what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, but I'm particularly interested not um, so much in the prisoner experience, which there has been quite a bit of work on it, naturally, and for good reason. But I'm interested in the en scientists and engineers who designed the canal and who worked with the prisoners to build these canals. What is their story and what can we learn from their story? Um, the great Soviet writer, Nobel Prize winner Alexander Solzhenitsyn called the White Sea Baltic Canal the first great construction project of the Gulag Archipelago. The history of this canal, which for short I'll call the Bellamore Canal for White Sea Canal, was already made into legend in the 1930s. At the time of its construction, the Soviet government issued a publication which was um, 600 pages long. It's a book that was published in many different languages, including English. An edition was published in the UK, which was called the Stalin Bellamore Canal. And the book's central theme was the notion of Perekovka, or literally reforging. The idea that through forced labor and ideological fervor, each convicted prisoner who worked at Bellamore to build it could reshape their own lives, not only to be moral and modest subjects dedicated to Soviet rule, but also to embody in their lives all that was uplifting and powerful and selfless about Soviet rule. Um, more recently, the history, scope, and legacy of this particular canal has been the subject of a lot of scholarly attention, um, and, and particularly with the opening of the archives of the 1990s. Historians, both in Russian and English, have produced really fantastic works uh, that go beyond the economic history of the construction of the canal exploration of the lives and subjectivities of the men and women who lived and worked at the canal. So my talk is very much indebted to these historians, uh, Konstantin Yetnev, Yuri Dmitriev, who's actually uh, in, just recently imprisoned by Vladimir Putin for being a his, actually good historian, uh, but many others too in the U.S., Cynthia Ruder, Julie Dreskozy, Nick Barron, and others. So I build on their work to really, as I said, think about the population of engineers and scientists who worked in the canal. Um, and I try to uncover the particular ways in which science and engineering were recruited and mobilized to build this large scale infrastructure, but with the benefit of mass forced labor to participate in what I call an infracarceral project. Such projects, I, arg I argue, depend on forms of colonial violence and environmental damage, even as they render the human costs invisible upon the unveiling of the artifact to the public. So before I get to these questions, I want to give a very brief account of the history of the canal, just so we're all on the same page. The idea for a canal to link the Baltic Sea with the White Sea was not a new one. Again, I don't know if you can see this map, but basically uh, on the bottom, they have the Baltic Sea, and in the middle or top right-hand corner is the White Sea. And in order to navigate from the two spots, basically you had to go all the way around Scandinavia, which took weeks at the time. So the idea was maybe there's a way to cut across the land and build a canal. And so it's it's conceptually a, a simple idea. And people have been thinking about doing such a thing since the time of Peter the Great. So this was not a new idea. Once the Bolsheviks came to power in 1917, there were also sporadic attempts to do something. But it was only in 1930 when the Soviet government under Stalin approved a plan to build a canal as part of the first five-year plan. And also kind of broader imperative to 
developed this region known as uh, Karelia, which is lodged between Finland on the one hand and Russia proper. And you can see the Republic of Karelia in the middle. And Karelia is, um, is a place with its own distinct cultural character. Um, although most people speak Russian, I guess 60% or so, a good 35% speak Karelian, which is a Finnish dialect and they have you know, a very different non-Russian cultural norms. So the idea was to basically build a canal through Karelia and connect Leningrad with um, um, archangels. So really, really very lengthy waterway that would connect these two, um, the Black Sea with the White Sea. And the idea was to build something that was 18 feet deep so that very large vessels could navigate through it. So in 1930, Stalin signed uh, the creation of a special committee to supervise construction of the project. Uh, uh, an organization known as Bellamore Stroy or Bellamore Construction was organized, and they started to essentially think about building the canal as part of the five-year plan. Uh, originally, the project was completely under civilian um, control, meaning that regular ministries and wage labor was working on it. But sometime in late 1931, Stalinist administrators abruptly transferred the whole project to an organization known as the OGPU, which may be familiar to some of you, which is the predecessor of the KGB, basically, the Soviet secret police. So this happened in late 1931, a decision that's never been clear why this happened, but I guess in some ways it, there's a kind of macabre logic to it. The OGPU was at that time expanding its forced labor network, the Gulag Cap network uh, in the Northern Soviet Union. And once the project moved under its auspices, it started to introduce forced labor into the building of the canal. And uh, once you, and this is the design or the map of the actual canal, they set up a camp known as Bel Baltalag, which would house tens of thousands of prisoners in a small town in Karelia known as Medvezia Gora. And uh, initially 10,000 prisoners were brought here in 1931, increasing to 64,000 in 1932 and peaking out at about 125,000 in October, 1932. Wow. Um, so the labor and living conditions were horrific. Many felt sick, got injured, or died. And the best estimates are that about 12,000 prisoners died in the short time that it took to construct the canal, which is about two or two or three years. Um, and these are, uh, again, it's hard to see, but these are pictures of uh, the construction of the canal, laborers um, uh, building the canal. So the, when the canal was finished in 1933, about 200,000 people had built it. There were 19 locks, 15 dams, 12 waterways, 33 little artificial canals that controlled and redirected the water. But it was extremely hastily constructed. It was largely made of wood because of the requirement that only local uh, resources be used, which I'll get to why that decision was made. It was too shallow in the end to really take vessels over six feet in draft. And it functioned more as spectacle than for any real economic purpose, even though it's a monumental quality it was in some ways the goal, uh, I'm sorry, uh, was muted quite a bit. And I'll explain that in a, sec in a second. A leading Bolshevik, Vyacheslav Molotov, stepped in to formally open the canal by edict in the middle of 1933. And Stalin himself uh, appeared um, on a boat, Danukin, in July of 1933 with some of his colleagues traveling through the entire length of the canal. And it is rumored that Stalin was unimpressed perhaps by some heightened expectations of seeing something massive and monumental and finding its material reality rather falling short of his expectations. Uh, so the publicity surrounding the opening of the canal was at a fever pitch in, the, in that year, 1933. Soviet newspapers reported daily on its various capabilities, recounting the experiences of the you know, first passages through such and such ship. And as I said, a book was published, a 600 page long book, which was um, authored by a, a group of Soviet, oops, I'll just, let me just go again. Um, so this book was authored by a group of um, famous Soviet authors, including Maxim Gorky and uh, Alexei Tolstoy, not Leo, Lev Tolstoy, War and Peace fame, but Alexei Tolstoy, who was uh, another author of the early 20th century. And um, this group of authors traveled through the canal, they interviewed people, and they produced this tract, which was essentially extolling the kind of notion of reforging 
and saying that the labor was in, in support of, you know, some Soviet civilization and these kinds of things, that it had revitalized socialism, the building of the canal. So that's really the story of the canal in a kind of very quick nutshell form. So now I want to turn to the experts, like who were they? Uh, what kind of worldview did they bring to the project? What was their experience? And finally, what was their legacy? The role of scientists, engineers, planners, and technicians in the design and construction of the Bellamore Canal is, uh, you know, it's a story marked by discontinuities, precarity, and most of all, missing evidence. So what I'm presenting today is really a sort of fragmentary reconstruction because there's so much missing. Some of the engineers who were there at the beginning were gone by the end of the canal, time the canal was introduced or even dead. Uh, the fragmentary documentary record also clearly underscores that in the very early stages, the project was implemented, as I mentioned, through normal institutional channels, through ministries of railways and communications and waterways and so forth, but at some point switched over to the OGPU and the Gulag system. And it turns out, as I kept digging and digging, that this switch occurred partly because of the recommendation of scientists and engineers who demanded large amounts of labor for the construction of the canal in the, in the end of 1931. And that key recommendation um, sort of led to a very different path to the construction of the canal. And most strikingly, because so many, I found almost the entire engineering team that worked on the Bellamore Canal, which is in Karelia, just south of the Arctic Circle, had originally sort of cut their teeth in Central Asia in the exact same spot studied by Maya Peterson in her book, Pipe Dreams in Soviet Central Asia. And I'll get to that connection in a second. What brought them from Central Asia to Karelia and what did they bring because of that experience? So in the very early part of the process, one of the key figures that I kept running into was a man named Anatoly Sergeyevich Aksamitny on here. A man whose key role in the original conception of the canal disappeared from the historical record. In fact, nobody, almost no books ever even mentioned his name. Uh, so it's almost, uh, he's like a skeletal ghostly figure hanging over this story. But it turns out he clearly shaped crucial aspects of the project before his untimely and tragic end. He came to Bellamore already with a sterling reputation as a hydraulic engineer as and, uh, and one of so the Soviet Union's foremost experts in canals and dams. And this, he, he was an expert already in the czarist era and during the 1910s, he advised the Tsar on various canals and dams and things like that. And most of his work was in the Caucasus with the, the, the Don River and the Volga River, which were you know, the two massive rivers in central Russia. Um, and he claimed that he even spoke to Lenin. We don't know if this is true. I found his some of his papers that he spoke to Lenin about the White Sea Canal sometime in the early 20s. And eventually, uh, sometime in early 1930, probably in February 1930, Aksamitny appears to have been plucked out from the Caucasus and brought to Leningrad to join the feasibility studies of the Bellamore Canal, becoming the chief engineer of its construction. He was not only tasked with leading the engineering aspects of this daunting project, but also put in charge of assembling a team of experts to survey, design, manufacture the canal. And so really, really incredibly huge responsibility. And many of the experts in this first round of culling that he invited to uh, Bellamore were uh, experts who were already working on other canal systems throughout the Soviet Union and the Volga Marines Canal System, the Kama Pechora Waterway, and et cetera. So many, he sort of called a huge team together um, to work on this canal. And one of the people that he brought to work with him uh, at Bellamore was another gentleman named Sergei, let's see, um, Sergei um, Yakovlevich Zhuk on the right. Now, he's the person you immediately run into if you start to read Bellamore Canal histories. Uh, you see up everywhere his name. He's the designer, he's the this, he's the that. So it turns out that, so I started digging into Zhuk's life, but also a very skeletal, ghostly sort of presence in all of this. Zhuk was eight years younger than Aksamitny and one of the only two engineers who were given an Order of Lenin uh, awarded the conclusion of the building of the Bellamore Canal. And later on in the 1940s, 50s, uh, he enjoyed an illustrious career um, with many awards and uh, became a full member of the USSR Academy of Sciences and so forth. And until recently, I think around the year 2000, the major Russian, Russian Institute on Hydraulic Power was named after Zhuk, but they took his name off in 2000. So there is a darker aspect of his story scattered in places. And if you look in the Gulag Archipelago by Alexander Solzhenitsyn, 
Um, he identifies six of the principal lieutenants who he thinks were responsible for the massive death at Bellamore. The 12,000 died. And in those six names, he names Stalin, Yagoda, et cetera, et cetera. But he includes Sergei Zhukin, that a scientist, uh, a clearly, uh, you know, a, a hydraulic engineer who had no business being on that list. So it's all it's a very interesting sort of uh, tangent that led me to a different part of his story. As I said, his early life remains marred in mystery. He clearly worked with Aksamitni at some point in the Volga Don Canal um, in 1928. I have records of him visiting Germany to study the operation of canals and locks, experience that undoubtedly granted him some prominence. Um, and essentially, I, there's reason to believe that Zhuk owed his career to Aksamitni. And like the latter, Zhuk had also graduated from the same institution, Institution of Transportation Engineers in Petrograd, implying a connection that dated back to before the revolution. So when Aksumitny was recruited for Bellamore, he brought Zhuk along with him, appointing him his deputy, the chief of the technical sector of Bellamore story. So with Aksumitny and Zhuk at the helm, these two men, the Bellamore story authority conducted a vast amount of pre preliminary scientific technical work. This was in 1930 at the very early stages of the canal. Um, they had about 300 experts with them, including engineers, geologists, uh, topographers, hydrologists, etc. Uh, this was paid work. A lot of the people involved at this time were university graduate students who went out and basically surveyed the land because we knew so little about, they knew so little about the land. Um, this was extremely difficult. As I said, this is close to the Arctic Circle and there's permafrost in the land. Um, and the terrain has extremely hard uh, types of rock. Uh, uh, which are common to the Baltic area, which are extremely sort of difficult to navigate. Um, anyway, <laughs> um, uh, very festive. But um, so, um, which contrasts with this story, which, which isn't very festive. Uh, so anyway, they they did a survey, as I said, these three hundred, mostly young people that Aksumitni and Juk had put together. And uh, they reported, issued a report saying that, look, we can do this canal. Uh, we, and we can make this thing. It's possible to do it. And they had a very detailed sort of proof of concept report, I guess. And um, But one thing they noted, and this was in the late summer of 1930, they noted that, that this canal will not be easy to build. It'll require lots of problems. And one of the main impediments is the shortage of engineers. And Aksumitni, there's a note by Aksumitni saying, we have, uh, we require about 115 qualified graduate engineers to do this, and we only have 62. So we need more of them, a shortage of 53 people. But where to find engineers? And so this news sort of trickled back up to the OGPU, which, as I said, was the secret police. And two apparatchiks, apparatchiks Yakov Rapoport and Vladimir Kishkin at the OGPU, got this note and essentially started to think about where to get engineers. And both had worked in the economic directorate of the OGPU for a while. And this economic directorate of the OGPU was essentially responsible for investigating industrial accidents and malfeasance, but it ended up being a kind of monitoring authority in the 1920s for Soviet um, to sort of ideological control of engineers, engineers. And so one of the things Rappaport and Kishkin did was they started scouring through prisons looking for engineers who they could get. Now, why were scientists in prison at all in the 1920s? And this is in the late 20s, um, early 30s. So a little background is necessary here. From the beginning of the Bolshevik era, the relationship between the political elite and the scientific elite was fraught with tension. On the one hand, party leaders such as Lenin, especially Lenin, recognized that scientists and engineers would be indispensable to modernizing Russia. On the other hand, there was a deep suspicion of the scientific community because most of them had been educated before 1917 under the czars, meaning they had what they considered bourgeois proclivities. They were steeped in bourgeois culture, elitism, and they were sort of, their concerns were academic and unrelated to the needs of the common man. And they were out in their ivory, ivory tower thinking about abstract theoretical problems. So they saw this as a kind of conundrum. We need the experts, but we can't trust them because they're basically bourgeois. So what do we do? So there were two strategies at hand. One was, well, why don't we throw these guys into prison? And second, we'll train a new generation to replace them. But while they're in prison, we can make use of them. And so between 1928 and 1930, uh, several hundred specialists, very highly elite scientists, really incredibly talented people 
were put into prison uh, because of, after some show trials, the Shakti and Industrial Party Affair trials. And those people essentially were given jobs in prison as um, uh, kind of uh, a counterpoint to not manual labor, but intellectual forced labor. But Rappaport and Kishkin were uh, unsatisfied with this, with this solution to scour prisons. And so one memo, which I found was, well, this is fine, but they say we also need several more suitable persons and these should be arrested, meaning that we should go beyond the ones who are already in prison to arrest others. So these few words to deliberately arrest people to work on the project instead of using already arrested people for this purpose opened up an entirely new option for the OGPU to accelerate the project to completion. So what the OGPU needed were engineers specializing in water or to be more precise, hydraulic engineers. And in looking for some such experts, the OGPU did not have to look far for its economic directorate, the department which Rappaport and Kishkin had cut their teeth, was already ensnared in a campaign colloquially known as the irrigation conspiracy to arrest exactly such engineers, not in Karelia near the Arctic, but thousands of miles away in Soviet Central Asia. And the central figure in this investigation, one who would play an extremely important role at Bellamore, was one Georgi Konstantinovich Rizemkampf. So this guy. And this guy um, is also uh, quite um, a prominent personality in Maya's book too. So I'll come back to that in a second. So Riesenkampf was the founding director of something called the Scientific Institute for Land Reclamation based in the city of Tashkent. And um, he uh, also had a very long career um, in various um, irrigation and drainage plants in Central Asia, particularly in the Golodnaya steppes, the Hungary steppes, which Maya writes about, in the Russian imperial province of Turkestan. Again, it's hard to see this map, but Turkestan was essentially a kind of manufactured conglomeration of various ethnic nationalities that the Russian empire had put together. Nowadays, it's disaggregated into four or five different countries, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, and Kyrgyzstan. But at the time, the Russian under the czars had sort of created this artificial conglomeration. So um, um, recent Kampf had worked in Turkestan, and like many, many elite engineers of his generation, he produced extremely ambitious plans for economic development that would literally recreate the Central Asian landscape as if, you know, geography or ecology or the environment could be completely subordinated to the whims of science and technology. This was the sort of very rational, almost quasi-utopian belief in the power of science to transform nature. Um, he founded major departments in, in the Turkestan State University. He had, he had many different programs in Central Asia. Rizenkamp's worldview that we can use science and technology to literally water all of Central Asia or to create new oases in, in, in hospitable regions was not an isolated one, but was shared by tens of thousands of Soviet scientists. And here I do want to take a short digression into that worldview. Why, where does this come from? The scale of Russian space, it's 9,000 kilometers from one end to another. And it's particular material, material features, you know, it's nebulous borders, it's striking variation in climate, it's uh, lopsided population distribution, it's multi-ethnic nature, all presented to, to most people, it presented a set of obstacles, but to the Russian scientific community, it presented an opportunity. Um, and many famous Russian scientists, such as Dmitry Mendeleev and uh, Vernadsky, and many have wrote copiously about how, what to do with this massive amount of space that we have under our control. And it was always sort of couched in terms of, we have to use um, science and technology to bring it under our heel. We have to conquer the space. We have to understand it. We have to <laughs> extract from it. And after 1917, they added Marx to this um, ethos that, so there's a millenarianism sort of added to it that this is really transformative and will change civilization, so to speak. So they're trying to really make meaning out of Russian space and to imagine reimagine the relationship between Russians, and I say Russians in quotes, and uh, the rest of uh, their country. Um, and of course, all of this is also in, in parallel with the kind of colonial minded activities of the czarist regime that has left a legacy for the Bolsheviks. Now, there's a long debate among historians about the colonial nature of the Soviet Union. And some of this goes back, of course, to the 
the time of the czars, when the Russian Empire was both expansionist and colonial in nature. Beginning in 1865, the czars basically violently and deliberately subjugated many, many diverse peoples across Central Asia and Siberia, etc. Uh, they, um, you know, imposed draconian laws, uh, deliberately designed to dampen, extinguish other cultures, and so forth. But what happens in 1917 when Lenin and the Bolsheviks come in is that they are in possession in a huge expanse. Um, uh, of which only 40% are ethnically Russian, and the rest of are very many, many different nationalities of the 125 million people. Now, as some of you know, when Lenin came to power in 1917, he had actually a very, um, he had his nationalities policy, you know, what to do with the non-Russian peoples, was a kind of moderate form of um, self-rule, that we should allow these people to have some moderate forms of nationalism, because this will sort of be a vent for the much more extreme and violent form of nationalism. So we allowed them to express themselves in moderated controlled ways so that they get it out of their system. That's sort of a reductive way to say it. And uh, Terry Martin and others have written about this. It's that they call it affirmative action empire that you sort of let people have a little bit, but not too much. Uh, but by the 1930s, this kind of policy eventually is abandoned completely and they move towards a fundamentally kind of um, more, much more violent form of um, nationalities policy, uh, coupled with brute force development programs that they bring pretty much all over the Soviet Union, uh, with building infrastructure, uh, Russianizing everything, and so forth. And although they were coded differently, these Soviet practices very much echoed closely in form and content, older civilizing missions, I think, redolent of European colonialism. And Central Asia was an important site for this kind of vision. And water was really the core issue here. And I want to quote Maya Peterson here, if you can read it. She says, water was key to the transformation of Central Asia into a region that its Russian and Soviet rulers considered fruitful and prosperous, since the waters of Central Asian rivers could be used to transport good, troops and goods, empower or limit the autonomy of Central Asian cities and states, grow cotton and other agricultural products, water the fields and orchards of European settlers, power machinery and industry and provide light to rural areas. And in that quote, you could actually replace Central Asia and think about the French in West Africa or some other kind of place. And it, it really sort of, you know, sort of conveys the kind of colonial project that is going on in Central Asia. Um, as Maya and many other historians have shown, hun the hundreds of sort of engineers sent out to the region to Central Asia were part of these state initiatives to modernize the so-called colonial periphery. So which br brings me back to Georgi Rizankamp, who I mentioned earlier, who internalized this worldview. He wanted, he had an earnest commitment to transformative projects for the Russian landscape in Central Asia, a quasi-utopian sort of urges to rebuild the world. And, um, but at the peak of his professional life, it started to fall apart. Rizankamp, as I mentioned, there were, the, there were now plans afoot to arrest engineers, was suddenly arrested, um, on uh, in September 1929 and that's on the right is his arrest photograph and framed as a heart of a he was framed basically as the head of a massive but faked counter-revolutionary conspiracy and then in early 1931 about a year and a half after his arrest uh, precisely when they needed engineers for Bellamore they moved recent camp and all of the other engineers who were arrested with Brisson camp, I guess I skipped over that, but recent camp wasn't the only one arrested. They started several dozen engineers in Central Asia and eventually became hundreds. Um, they moved all of these engineers. They left the tropical desert of Kyrgyzstan and arrived after a four and a half thousand kilometer train voyage to a spot just south of the Arctic Circle at the Bellamore Canal construction headquarters at Medgora. And by the time that these men arrived to work on the White Sea Baltic Canal, the entire project had undergone a profound transformation. Almost all the original engineers who had come, uh, like Aksumitni, were all gone. So what happened to the original crew who did all the survey work? Well, as I said, the original lead engineer for Belomar was a man named Anatoly Aksumitni. He was no longer there. And his fate is also somewhat of a mystery. But what I've been able to find is he was sent on a trip in October 1930 down to the Volga region. And those OGPUs suddenly arrested him, and we still don't know why. Um, although, you know, it doesn't really matter because they, these, these reasons or rationales were often made up. Um, and he was accused of being some sort of uh, counter revolutionary and a head of a terrorist organization. And under psychological pressure, probably physical torture, he confessed to his guilt 
Um, he was again taken back and forth to Moscow. And one of, on one of these trips, uh, it seems he tried to jump out of the train and they shot him and he died. And this was in May, 1931. Um, so Aksumitni disappeared from the project, but he left one important legacy. And this is why the story is so complicated. It was his calculations that determined the number of forced laborers called for the canal project. Originally in August, 1930, he estimated a force of 20,000 workers. Although at the time it was assumed that they would be from the mainstream wage labor force from the Soviet economy. But with manual labor and wood and other for, sorts of technological fixes uh, recommended because of high costs, he suddenly switched his, changed his mind. And in a memo from fall of 1930, he notes uh, that he, he, the project needs uh, 100,000 people. In, and so, suddenly the number of laborers and forced laborers becomes defined by Aksumitni in this particular memo. And when the new imprisoned engineers arrived from Central Asia, they also began to support even more increases they, in terms of needing more forced labor. So why the focus on labor and building an infrastructural project? Once again, let's re return to Maya Peterson, who notes in her book, Pipe Dreams, that planners and engineers in Central Asia, for the most part, eschewed advanced technological fixes in favor of mass labor as an instrument of development. In writing of one such vast complex in Central Asia, Maya notes, quote, human labor became a substitute for time and technology alike, end of quote. Undoubtedly, this worldview shaped the decisions at Bellamore in early 1931. So many factors are shaping the design of this canal, the climate, the terrain, and other requirements. But the specific material reality of the Bellamore Canal reflected these intertwined ideologies that forced labor would compensate for other shortcomings, including cost, that scientific expertise was completely portable and could be moved from one climate to another without any accounting for local concerns, and that the project had to have a display value above and beyond its utility. And these ideological underpinnings of what I call an infra-carceral project were in fact articulated explicitly in Bellamore documents from 1932 on the state of the construction of the canal. Here's a quote, when designing the main structures, the task was set to develop such structures that would require a minimum of natural resources, could be built in the shortest possible time, would require minimum of expenses, would require maximum labor, and be subordinated to the OGPU. So um, let's see, I'm just seeing how much time. All right. So in the remainder of the time I have, I want to sort of go through a little bit of a couple of uh, a, couple, a few words about the engineers themselves as they worked on this project. There was actually an organization called the Special Construction Bureau at the canal headquarters, and that's where all the engineers worked together. They were mostly in their mid to late 40s, although the age spread, spread was quite large. Many of them had been educated at a single institution in Petrograd before the war, so they were all bourgeois uh, specialists in that sense. The majority had come from Turkestan, from Tashkent especially, working on a variety of irrigation dam and water direction projects in an extremely arid climate as part of the Turkestan Water Administration. Their expertise, as was obvious to many, was severely mismatched in working in the near Arctic conditions in Karelia. None had worked on a project of this ambition, uh, um, and both in terms of terrain and, and its carceral nature. But they all understood that their design choices would be shaped by the avail availability of mass forced labor. And um, I, I have many descriptions of many of these engineers. And I'll just mention, um, sorry, let me see. Um, uh, so, um, Clement Zubrik was one of the key engineers who came from Central Asia. He worked with Rizenkampf in Turkestan. And uh, he was sentenced to 10 years in a labor camp as an engineer, and he was brought to Bellamore. And he was tasked with designing durable structures for the dam made of wood. And this move from the desert to permafrost was not an easy one to make, but he was one of the few who, were, who was able to actually produce things for Bellamore that actually worked. And he designed at least four hydraulic structures, including a shipping lock and a spillway dam that was considered by camp authorities one of the most effective. And for his work, he was released from confinement rarely early, uh, relatively early, and his criminal record expunged. Now I'll come back to him and others who were released in a second and what that means when you're released. Um, 
one other point about this is that a lot of the imprisoned engineers who were from uh, Turkestan and Central Asia worked with free engineers. There was a coterie of engineers who were free, who had just come from Moscow or Leningrad to advise on the project. So free and imprisoned engineers worked together in the drafting tables. They were but worked together in terms of designs. But at the end of the day, the free engineers went home and the imprisoned ones went back to their barracks. Um, and um, probably the most glaring case of a free expert in contact with imprisoned ones was the case of Sergei Zhuk, who I mentioned before, uh, who was a, who had become the effective chief designer of the Bellomar project after Aksumitni disappeared. And his importance to the project was repeatedly emphasized in the official record to certain qualities like his intuition and his ability to speak to uh, people from all different classes and so forth. And Zhuk's name was given prominent heading in, in a major decree published in Soviet newspapers on August 5th, 1933, granting him uh, several awards for his heroic work. Um, so sporadically, and then in larger numbers, um, more and more people were released in 1932 and elevated to the same category as Zhuk. In other words, they had to work with him, but now they were free because they had been freed because they had introduced some innovation into the canal and so forth. But what did that really mean? Um, their lives remained constrained by the requirement that although they were free, that they remain in place as official employees of the OGPU secret police. In other words, the idea was to migrate the imprisoned experts from the OGPU managed canal system to the OGPU actual bureaucratic staff and the Gulag camp system. In this way, the wave of releases from the Bellamore Canal of engineers in 1932 and 33, and there's dozens of them, seeded a huge population of experts, scientists, engineers, and technicians into the formal employment of the OGPU successor, the NKVD, and into an array of high-profile infrastructural projects identified with the Stalinist industrial campaigns of the 30s, 40s, and 50s. So essentially, that the, the process seeds all of these people into future infrastructural projects. All of these engineers go off, but now essentially as managers at the NKVD level. Um, and I have many details here, which I'll skip over of many of these engineers and what ranks they had at the NKVD. Um, this picture of Zhuk is interesting because he's wearing an NKVD uniform. Now remember, he's, he came in as a scientist. He was a professor and um, ended up working for the NKVD and eventually um, Zhuk's life is extremely interesting, um, you know, identified as one of the half a dozen perpetrators of the horrors of Bellamore. Um, he, in the 1930s, he's appointed the project director of many, many different hydrological or hydraulic projects across the Soviet Union. He becomes a major general of the security services. And um, he's even disciplined once for, quote, barbaric and uh, behavior at the construction site. But this allegation appears not to have impeded his career in the Gulag. Um, in the 1950s, he's elected a full member of the Academy of Sciences. Oops. Uh, uh, that's his official picture from the right. And in 1957, when he passed away, Nikita Khrushchev signed his obituary. There was no mention of his work and of, or his actual employer for the past 25 years. So what to make of all of this? I have five minutes left, and uh, I'll try to sort of wrap everything up. Um, and I, I, I can answer a lot of the, if you have any questions about the project um, in the Q&A. I want to conclude with both a summary and restatement of my principal claims organized around three broad points that I hope will communicate why the story I just shared is important. My first is about the Stalinist Gulag, that the OGP's, OGPU's experience in the creation of the White Sea Baltic Canal was ground zero for the expansion of the Gulag labor camp network. It was a test site that validated the notion of the infracarceral project. Already before the official completion of this canal, the Soviet government issued official resolutions in the fall of 1932, giving formal patina to the growing network of Gulag camps. It created new labor camps in the Komi region, new ones in the Moscow Volga, Volga region, new ones to support the Baikur, Amil, uh, Baikal Amur Railway. The OGPU management also migrated to these other projects as did a considerable portion of the expertise, the engineers that I have just mentioned, now seeded into a vast empire belonging to the Gulag. They brought with them experience from Central Asia, from Karelia, from Bellamore, expertise that they now applied to these other projects, 
each built as a further elaboration of the model of the infracarceral project. So in that sense, Bellamore was really ground zero for this kind of expertise that seeds out to the Soviet Union. Second, in the ongoing debates about the nature of colonial violence and domination under Soviet rule um, and its internal periphery, particularly in Central Asia and also the Arctic, the experience of the Bellamore Canal suggests experts and infrastructure were key instruments of this internal colonization. Few have ever considered the Bellamore Canal a colonial project given that it was within Russia proper, but its use of migrated expertise from one colonial periphery, Soviet Turkestan, to another, Russian Karelia, suggests a kind of conveyor belt of colonial expertise that reinforced and circulated an extractive and developmentalist mindset. In Central Asia, as Mai Peterson has shown, the work of experts, hydraulic engineers, irrigation specialists, land reclamation scientists represented a very dominant and distinct strand of Soviet science and technology, which saw their mission to reimagine, reorder, and supposedly revitalize what they considered the Soviet hinterland to modernize these supposedly empty spaces. Mm -hmm. In this project and in others, state and science were completely co-aligned. As instruments of internal colonization of Russia and later the Soviet Union, they applied their expertise to the technocratic future of the Bolshevik state. In that sense, I argue that the Bellamore Canal, thought of for the longest time as a monument to Stalinism, was also quint quintessentially a colonial project of the 20th century. And it's worth pointing out another thread of the story. I've mentioned the engineer Sergei Zhuk a few times, who inherited the Bellamore Canal project after his boss Aksumitny was killed trying to escape. The organization that Zhuk headed in the last decades of his life, Gidro Project, survived past his death and into the 1960s, and in fact still exists today. This is the building in Moscow. Mm -hmm. During the Cold War, Gidro Project, using much of the same technical approaches used in building the Bellamore Canal, exported its canal and dam building expertise to a vast number of different countries, including Angola, Egypt, Ethiopia, China, Vietnam, India, Iraq, Syria, and Peru. All of these water direction infrastructural projects are extensions of Bellamore's original colonial ethos. And there is a third and final point I want to make about this story, and that is the story of what I call the infracarceral project, or large scale infrastructural projects that use mass carceral labor, a criteria which in turn shapes certain design decisions that have deleterious environmental costs. Massive canal projects were in many ways a perfect emblem of Stalinist industrialization's relationship with the natural world as the new Soviet man brought to bear both his hands and the world of new technology to physically redirect, reconstruct, and revitalize the landscape of the Soviet Union. Water as a source of life and as a source of energy was both the subject and object of this narrative of conquest of nature, particularly in its ability to serve as spectacle, a monument to the achievements of Stalinism. This kind of hydraulic monumentalism technology as display highlights one peculiar aspect of the empire of gulag infrastructures, that what the gulag produced was designed to be visible and even spectacular, but the carceral nature of the labor behind it was entirely invisible. In rendering the camps and the camp experience invisible in the presentation and discussion of these mega projects, the Soviet state sought to denude these projects of ambiguity, presenting them as monolithic and without messiness both as object and history-making narrative. Infracarceral projects were, and are of course not exclusive to Soviet Stalinism. In fact, as coercive labor practices intensify globally, and more specifically, the carceral population rises unabated, especially in the United States, we find echoes of such projects far from Karelia and the Bellamore Canal. The guiding features of such projects, the use of mass coerced labor for massive infrastructural projects, where the use of such labor is both crucial and simultaneously rendered invisible, where colonial and extractive practices are reconfigured in the language of modernization, and where a kind of rationalist, anti-humanist expertise circulates globally, are emblematic of many large infrastructural projects today, from Doha, Dubai, and Abu Dhabi, to many projects in China, and yes, to the growing private prison industrial complex in the United States. In all of these cases, the violence rendered is masked by spectacle, by a kind of monumentalism to modernity. The true legacy of Bellamore is that its story continues now permutated into new forms and new spectacles. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.
Okay. Right. Right. Yeah, thank you for your, that's a great question. Um, excuse me. Um, as I mentioned, prior to 1917, the czarists had relatively good engineering schools that were much more aligned, let's say, with European models of engineering education. After 1917, there was a move by the late 20s to completely revamp that system. And so what two things start to happen. One, one is that they still have a mass of old specialists who are trained prior to 1917 and what to do with them. And I talked a little bit about that. But there is a push to educate a new generation. And in doing that, they start to create what's called two things. One is vocational schools, which are very specialized. So you essentially, it's like a, going to high school and learning a couple of things that you need to do in a factory. But in terms of higher education, they also become extremely specialized. So there's a Moscow Aviation Institute, or there's a Moscow Railway Institute, and so forth. So education becomes extremely specialized and subordinated to economic development. There's a notion that Engineers and academics are too often in an ivory tower. So all sorts of theoretical, um, higher sort of, um, I don't want to say higher, but theoretical concerns are de-emphasized in favor of practical concerns. And that's, that's the general trend in engineering in the Soviet Union until really the 1960s. Yes, please. Oh, yeah, that's a that's also a good question about the uh, oops, sorry. Uh, so, yeah, the actual forced labor, as I said, about 200,000 laborers worked at Bellamore um, and different infrastructural projects needed different amounts of labor. The labor, um, I don't I hate to call it rank and file, but it's basically mass labor was essentially called they weren't arrested for the projects. They were already, you know, in some fashion arrested for other things so it's uh, yeah although that's a i guess a subtle distinction but basically through the 1960s sorry 1930s there's an increasingly sort of more um, draconian and repressive state apparatus that begins to arrest people and which peaks out in the great purges of the late 30s so they have a lot of people in prison it's not like they need to arrest more people for the infrastructural projects so they're already tapping into existing prison populations Yeah, and this was part of the um, massive population came from the campaign of collectivization, which happened in the Soviet villages between 1928 and 1932, which was to go into the countryside and because there was still private property in the 1920s, uh, a limited market economy existed, and they completely nationalized all property. So lots of people resisted that when they came to get your plot for the state. In that confrontation, people were arrested, and literally millions of people resisted uh, between that period. So most of the people who worked at Bellamore were peasants who had been dispossessed of their land because of collectivization. Yes. And I wonder, if this is all the best engineering that we can get there, how do you analyze that failure? So that is a failure of knowledge at that time, or is it somehow connected to the cultural regime? Right. And there's a 
Okay, okay. Sorry, thank you. So the first question was about um, the social dynamics of work between arrested and free engineers in the drafting areas and the labs. Yeah, this is a really interesting question. I've, you know, the, the evidence I have is from interviews, memoirs, and so forth. There's a great degree of social tension. It's not, it's not like we're just all in the same boat. In fact, um, it's, it's, uh, it, the tension is to the point where people don't want to work with each other, that sort of thing, but they have to. The other tension point was that often the head of a project was a prisoner, uh, but the junior second member was free. So the, the, the junior member who was free had to follow the orders of the head of the project who was a prisoner. And this produced all sorts of social tensions uh, within the project. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, the, I'd say largely, this was a, a source of tension and uh, problems. The second question, um, <clears throat> I'm trying to remember what you, all right. So if I understood your question, the question was about, uh, you know, the canals and the poor quality of the canal. Was this a failure of engineering or was there some other factor in this? And I, as I said, I think this has to do with what I'm trying to get at is that I don't think this is a, the short answer is I don't think this is a failure of engineering talent or anything like that. This is people put in a particular situation where they have to deal with some extremely severe constraints. The reason why they had used wood, which seems completely absurd to build a canal of wood, the reason why one they and everybody understood that it's not like they're stupid. They they understand that this is a ridiculous challenge to do. Uh, and by the way, there were some extremely interesting innovations that they introduced into the canal with screens over the wood with special forms of peat and mud that actually protect and insulate this wood for decades. So, you know, people did come up with things, I suppose, um, um, was because they wanted to reduce costs and do it very quickly. Now, men, meaning don't use metal and steel and those kinds of things. And the reduce, reduction of costs went into wood because there was enormous amounts of forests nearby. So they def, deforested essentially a huge part of the Karelia forest through mass labor and <clears throat> produce this canal. So there's a kind of environmental damage to it. And this is why I call this infracarceral projects are, are about reducing costs and doing something quickly because the spectacle is more important, it's urgent. And so that that has secondary and tertiary effects on the environment, which we're un, un, unable to see. But yeah, I don't think it's a failure of engineering per se, but I think it's a failure of the social constraints and, and other things of the engineering teams. Yeah, back there. Mm. Mm. Sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. No, thank you. Yeah. These are good questions. Um, 
I, and so the question really is about, if I can paraphrase all the things, is about the, how should we see Soviet science? Uh, many have seen it as a kind of, you know, aberration or some sort of exception to the rule and normative science. In our studies of normative science, we sort of fall back on Western science, or at least our studies are focused on Western science. Um, and um, how to really evaluate this, especially the aspect of its uh, spectacular nature and its spectacle. <clears throat> I have to say that, you know, I, I come from this position as, as trained as a historian of science, but also trained to some degree in STS that I don't see Soviet science as an aberration or an ex exception or, or anything. It is just another form of science, just like any other science. And science is socially constructed, uh, although that seems to be, you know, sort of, you know, people quib quibble with that. And there's all sorts of dangerous ways one can quibble with that. But I do think science is socially shaped and socially uh, constrained, socially conditioned. Um, and Soviet science was socially conditioned in a particular way. Um, all of the things that I've talked about in this paper, in one sense or other, would happen in any other milieu and have happened uh, in any other capitalist, you want to call it, or in Western milieu, but in maybe different degrees and lesser degrees. But I don't see this as exceptional. I think we, a lot of Soviet history, as Soviet historians, we struggle with this because our object of study is often demarcated off to the side. There's European history and then there's Soviet history, which all sorts of weird stuff happens. But we're going to come back to France and Germany and England and talk about European history. And I and I think a lot of Soviet historians would reject that notion. We tend to think we are really trying to think about all of this as one part of a much bigger, complicated set of problems. And science is very much part of that conversation. There has been a very much, I think, a rethinking about Soviet science since the days of the Cold War, the last 20, 30 years, including Lysenko and um, this notion of pseudoscience um, and what that means. I think the notion that Lysenko was pseudoscience was a, a kind of a way to really, um, uh, I'm trying to think through all this, um, a, ray, a way to undercut any kind of achievement that socialism might have had. This is sort of the Cold War rhetoric. And so, well, it's it, the, they're just pseudoscientists. They don't really know anything and they can't do anything. And if they did something, it was stolen from us, this sort of formulation. Um, I think that is a very, um, and I think that that model has been abandoned. And I think people are really, really thinking about enormous transmissions and flows of Soviet science across borders, through, even during the Cold War and co-productions and things like that. So, um, and I'll, I'll end with one thing, which is that um, the notion of um, pseudoscience, and I, maybe I should recommend Michael Gordon's book on pseudoscience, which is that pseudoscience itself is a moving target. And what is pseudoscience at one point may not be pseudoscience at another point or another time, another social milieu. So I'm, I'm a bit sort of wary to use those kinds of terms in, in thinking up through these problems. Thank you. Junaid, yeah. Think of what? A labor, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, thank you. So the question is, uh, how, as an engineer or an expert or a scientist, what is their approach to thinking about labor, especially use of large amounts of labor for scientific or engineering projects? This is a very difficult question that I haven't been able to uncover because, um, you know, if you think about large scale projects, um, you know, as, as an engineer, I, 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 I'm, it's hard to think about something, you know, I mean, you have to go back to antiquity or the ancient civilizations, like the pyramids and so forth, to think about mass labor. But I think this, and I think Maya talks about this in her book, which was really interesting, the way in which in Central Asia, the, the problem, the solution to big problems was mass labor. And the, that, that problem was, I think, a very, the, the way they arrived at that answer was not through a direct kind of you know, one-to-one -one correlation. I think it was shaped by many different considerations. I think it had to do with uh, providing employment, which also Maya talks about in her book about kind of providing one of the ways in which internal colonization occurred was to 
kind of mobilize local people through employment and that, thus they get they, they get recruited to support the state apparatus and so mass employment was all on their minds I, you know so there's many different reasons one might imagine mass labor as a solution i don't think it's simply that uh, we'll just throw a lot of people at this problem. There are other factors involved, but I do think that's an important question to think through. Yes, Indira, yeah. Oh, sure, I, I'm, I'm bad at keeping, I'm bad at keeping track. But if you, yeah. okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Right, right. So the yeah, the question, if I can paraphrase, is about a self-transformation, moral transformation, and happening in different ways in different milieus. In Central Asia, I think Maya's work would suggest through the environment and through food and other sorts of things to really transform your subjectivity, your 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 civic role, your place in society. And we see this in the Bellamore project too. And um I think this is part of a larger Soviet project um, that really emerged uh, in 1917, but really intensified in the 1930s, which is to build a new Soviet man, and which was, you know, man, not woman. It was sort of gendered. The notion, although women were included, but the notion of reforging is really powerful here. And reforging Perakovka, the word that is used here, was applied in many different contexts. That it's a, it has a quasi almost Christian kind of ethos. Mm -hmm. It's like you know, ultimately we are all flawed and we've sinned and those that sort of thing. And but we can be become better. All of us here at Bellamore are criminals because we resisted the police or we did something terrible. And now we can reforge, remake ourselves through labor. Um, and this kind of remaking, the notion of refashioning, was really pervasive in Soviet society in many different contexts and many different ways. Uh, you could refashion yourself through different job, different labor, through, uh, through food, through all, all manner of things, but all of it in service to some higher calling. So I, th I do think there is something there that Maya tapped into in a very innovative way, I think, that uh, I think we should look at again, because I think she left us these clues. I think I don't think anybody's really done a study of that yet. yet. Yeah, exactly. And I, yeah, and I think yeah, so yeah, really incredible stuff. Yeah. Thank you. So it's <laughs> Once we ever develop something, the poison is gone. I think we could go, you know, that that happens to be really a too. There's been a constant distribution. Yeah. No, well, I mean, so the question, and I think we can see that there's two parts to the question, which is what happened to the canal in World War II and during that period? But also, does it ever become a site of, you know, sort of conspicuous consumption, a tourist site, if you will, right? So the first question, the first um, question about what happens, well, the canal was very poorly made, as I said, in the 1930s. It was used, but it wasn't very useful. And uh, in, the, in the war, it was actually occupied by Finnish forces, because it's very close to Finland, and you know, the war breaks out with Finland, and parts of it are destroyed. 
Uh, it's made some use in the war, even though that was actually in the documents in 1930, 31, clearly show we need to build this because of the military stuff. We need to move ships and things. Uh, it is only in the 1950s and 60s that the canal is completely remade. The canal that exists now, which I showed you a picture of, is is a steel. It's a, it's not a wooden thing anymore. They've completely reconstructed it now. So it actually works like a real canal now. But that happened in the 50s and 60s when they finally went back to it and said, this is a piece of CRAP. And so, but um, but I will say that um, it is it is now a place of visitation. Yeah, yeah. For people in that region, uh, you know, it's quite beautiful. There's uh, videos and things on YouTube. You can see like drone pictures. Um, it's really amazing to witness. And the landscape is so gorgeous. But again, it masks an enormous site of violence because you, you, it's hard to look at this place without thinking of the 12,000 people who died building it. So, yeah. Any, well, um, thank you all for uh, indulging me. I, I want to thank uh, before uh, thank you to Maya especially because, as I said, her work is crucial to mine, and I, um, I, you know, there's no way to really um, <clears throat> say how much I'm indebted to her thinking, um, and I'm I'm not alone in that. So, I want to thank all of you for uh, listening to me, and you know, let's uh, go and have some tea or whatever. So, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. No, I was very happy to navigate the code. Sorry about the disruption. I, uh, I kept losing my thought. Oh, okay. Oh, I didn't, I was losing my train of thought. <laughs> So when you go down bay, you turn right, and it's right there. He is there. He is there. Thank you.